Welcome to Marietta College's Geology 112 Historical Geology's Lab Number 8. Today we're going to be exploring the geological history of the Grand Canyon using the skills that we've been slowly building up through the last couple of semesters, historical and physical geology. We're going to try to look at a general reference, which is the geological map of the Grand Canyon, and using the material there, plus some information that we're going to supply you, we're going to show you how you can interpret the geological history. Now there are several parts to this lab, and the first one is to basically take your printout, and there's a lab printout that you guys will have access to that you can download from Moodle, as well as a digital copy of this very map that, that's behind me at the Grand Canyon, and you will be able to work with those resources and slowly answer questions that will help you understand how we can interpret that geological history. And so the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to sort of walk through how to answer those questions. Keep in mind, if you get confused when you're pulling it up and you feel that you don't understand how to do the next step, please feel free to contact your lab instructor, Frank, or contact me, Dave Jeffrey, and you guys can ask us questions and we'll try to help you understand what the correct answers are. Just make sure that when you call us up or when you contact us, make it clear that you've made an attempt to try to understand that question yourself and we'll try to help you walk through what the correct answer should be. Now, again, the last part of the lab will be incorporating some of the fossils that you've been learning and we call it bi backwards biostratigraphy and I'll show you how to do that material after I've talked about the geological map. So first things first, let's talk about this map that's behind me on the board and it is like many other maps that you've seen this is a geological map so we've been working with a number of these it's very pretty it is on the base of a topographic map so it has all those standard things that you guys should be familiar with there are contour lines on here there are symbols that represent buildings trails roads and so forth and those things are standard and they should be similar to the ones that you've seen on other maps of, of, of topographic areas, even the one around Marietta College, Marietta, Ohio. Um, on the map, if I can zoom into a couple of things while I'm talking to you, it has, just like you can see in here, it has those contour lines. Now the extra things that it has include things like the colors. And the colors are the formations, that are cropping out in that area and the darker lines are actually the contacts between the formations. So we're going to discuss a little bit about how to make sure we can recognize the attitudes of the rocks, which rock layers we're looking at and so forth. Also, it, like we said, it has the standard things that are on all topographic maps such as down at the bottom, where, let's see if I can zoom in on that, is uh, a scale and you can see there also is a contour interval down here at the bottom the contour interval is 50 meters so that is in meters the scale is 1 to 100,000 so it's a slightly different scale than the maps that you would have been working with that were 15 minute quadrangles or seven and a half minute quadrangles each square which is basically a section in this part of the map is about a square mile as you can see down here comparing it to those those uh, that scale right there so slightly different scale now we're not going to be working too much with the township and range in this area but we are going to have to find some things on the map and I'll point some of those things out to you we also have a north arrow with the magnetic declination and information about what the title of the map is and who made it and so forth. Now one of the more important resources that you guys are going to be looking at during this lab is the legend for the map itself and that's this area up in the upper right hand corner and I want you guys to play, pay close attention to this because there are actually two columns here. Now the colors correspond to the colors on the map and they correspond with each different formation. 
Each formation has a symbol. And in our classes previously, you guys should be familiar with how the symbols are, are, are made. The first letter is generally the time period. And you can see for the Cambrian, it's a C with a line through it. For the Mississippian, it's an M. For the Pennsylvanian, it's a P with an extra line. Now, for the Proterozoic and the Precambrian rocks that are here, we actually have different symbols, such as X for the early Proterozoic and Y for the middle Proterozoic stuff. We don't have latest Proterozoic stuff. Oh, you might be able to think about maybe there's some sort of unconformity going on right there. But anyways, those symbols are used. Now, on, this right, on the left-hand side of this column, they're simply arranged by time so that you can see the time eras or periods that they belong to over here and associate that with the color and the symbol that you can find on the map. On the right-hand side, if you look closely at that, it, it's the same information. It's the same set of formations from top to bottom, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top, but it's, that column is mainly to show you the different names of the rocks. And there are even a few of them that show you a little bit more about the rock types. Now we're going to be feeding you a lot of that information during the lab itself. So make sure when you're, you get frustrated during doing the lab and you're trying to figure out an answer, remember to go back and read the material that we just told you before that answer. There's lots of hints and clues in the lab itself to help you answer the question that's being asked. So make sure you don't panic. And again, if you get to a point where you don't really understand exactly what we're asking, shoot us an email so that we can try to explain that to you. Now you might notice down here at the bottom of the legend, after looking at the, or after orientating yourself and figuring out a little bit about what the top part means, there are other standard geological symbols for faults, anticlines, synclines, um, strikes and dips. And we're not going to be paying as much attention to that in this lab like you did in the previous map where you looked at the Grand Canyon. Now I'm going to remind you of that because that's worthwhile to show you a portion of the lab that you did before was from this geological map of the Grand Canyon and it is actually the same as right in here. It's a slightly different scale but it showed that same area, a similar area with some similar features. So if you can remind yourself and remember back to that lab that you did a few weeks ago, that will help us out a little bit. Now, also on this map are a few other resources that are very valuable, such as down here on the bottom, there are several cross sections that geologists have constructed of the canyon. Um, you can see them labeled down here, A to A prime, B to B prime, C to C prime, D to D prime. D to D prime is right down in here. You can see that on the map. C to C prime, I think, is perpendicular to that. And if I'm looking in the right place, it cuts across D to D prime right in here. So we're actually looking at two different views of the same set of rocks. So that's the first cross, two cross sections. And cross-section B to B prime is, let's see, right in up oh, here. Here's cross-section B to B prime. Uh, cross-section A to A prime is a little farther over right there. So you can see different views and how that, in, from different orientations, from different locations, what the attitudes of the rocks may be in the deeper parts of the canyon and in the shallower parts as well. Now, also on this map are more than just those cross sections, but there are a lot of diagrams and photos at the bottom of the map, so we can gaze upon some of those very quickly. And I'd like you to pay attention to some of them. There are historical drawings of people that visited the Grand Canyon more than 100 years ago, old historic photographs, and very importantly is this diagram right here that's a picture of the canyon showing some old, deep, dipping rocks, and then some shallower horizontal rocks. So what we can actually see, this is actually called the great unconformity between the uh, Paleozoic and the Proterozoic rocks down here, and you'll have to tell us what type of unconformity that is. So we have a lot of resources on this map and a lot of information that's put on there. 
So make sure that you pay close attention and feel free to explore the map a little bit while you're doing the lab. Now I do want to do a few more little overviewy things here and I do need to zoom into some areas um, as we get started. If you guys were here in lab, I would of course try to ask you guys some real general questions about the map in the Grand Canyon. And one of the first things I might say is notice in the area of the map, we generally have a lot of this light blue color. Now that light blue color, if you look closely, it has a PK in it, and that corresponds in your legend to something called the Kaibab, the Permian Kaibab Formation. And that area, that bluish area that's over most of the map, is actually a plateau of horizontal rock. It's a layer of horizontal rock called the Kaibab Formation. And it is something that you would actually be driving across that plateau of the Kaibab Formation. And when you came up to the edge of the canyon, you would say, Holy moly, look at that big hole in the ground. So that's that horizontal layer of the Kaibab Formation. There used to be maybe thousands and thousands of meters of rock above that that have all been eroded away. But at some point, we eroded it down to that level, that base level. And at some other point later on, the base level got deeper. And the river started to carve down through those older sediments than even the Kaibab Formation. So one thing that I would ask you if you guys were here is to put your finger on the map where the Colorado River is. And I would ask a simple question that seemed kind of silly. Is the Colorado River at the bottom or the top of the canyon? Of course it's at the bottom of the canyon. The Colorado River carved out the canyon and dug down to the deepest, deepest rocks. Now I would ask you, so by the Colorado River down at the bottom of the canyon, is the Colorado there closest to the oldest rocks or the youngest rocks? And you, of course, would tell me that they're closest to the oldest rocks in the canyon. That's great, because that's absolutely perfectly correct. So the oldest rocks down here at the bottom of the canyon, and as you climb up the canyon, you go through progressively younger and younger rocks until you get to the top near the visitor center at the Kaibab limestone, the perm that Permian rock. So in between that bottom of the canyon and the top of the canyon, a whole lot of rocks representing a whole lot of geological history were deposited as sediments a long time ago. Now one of the main questions you're going to be asked are some simple things about the elevations within the canyon. And we have a problem with our map because your version of the map that is digital isn't so hot when it comes to actually looking at those elevation. So what, one thing I'm going to tell you is that the visitor center is down in the lower right hand side of the map, right in here. And one of the questions is, tell us the relief of the canyon in the area of the visitor center. And if you look at the elevation of the visitor center, you'll remember the definition of relief of the map is the difference between highest and lowest point. So the elevation around the visitor center, and then you'll also need an elevation around the river here, down by the river, uh, just below the visitor center. And what you can't really see from your map is that right down in here at the edge of the map, just off the, the screen that I'm showing you right there, is a contour line and it heads right in towards the visitor center and the number on that is 2150, 2150 meters. Now, so that's about the elevation of the edge of the canyon right here. If you go down to the bottom of the canyon near the river. Again, it's hard to read. Even if you had the actual map, you might need a little help with that. But what I will tell you is that right at the boundary between the pink and the green and orange layers in here, there's about a 1,000 foot contour line there. And then between that and the river, I can count four, count them, four contour lines. So, if the elevation at the bottom of that pink layer is about a thousand feet, or I'm sorry, a thousand meters, and then the contour interval is 50 meters, you subtract 50 times 4. Well, that's 200, okay. And that's about the elevation of the river right there. 
Now again, the other elevation, what we're going to try to use as well, and it's besides just relief, is trying to find out the thickness of the layers of rock. And if we can assume that the layers of rock are horizontal, such as is the case with many of the Paleozoic rocks, and we figured that out in the previous lab, and I'll explain that again to you guys. If you find the elevation of the lowermost Paleozoic rock, which is the Tpeat sandstone, and the elevation of the um, Kaibab formation, which is the youngest Paleozoic layer, that basically gives you the thickness of those layers. And hint, hint, I just told you that the bottom of that pink layer, which is the bottom of the Tpeat sandstone, is about a thousand meters of, above sea level. Another thing we want you guys to think about very closely is about the attitude and the orientation of the layers of rock that are here. Now if you remember back to a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, we looked at these Grand Canyon rocks and you showed us, we showed you how to determine whether the layers were horizontal, dipping, or vertical. And we've got cases of all of those here at in, within the Grand Canyon. Uh, so let's start out with way down there at the bottom of the canyon near the river where those old, old Proterozoic rocks are exposed. And that's right down in here. And what you determined in that previous laboratory was this, that when you look at those layers, you could look over in the key and determine that they were layers of schists and gneiss. So they actually are foliated metamorphic rocks. Many of those rocks were previously probably sedimentary rocks. They might have had layering to them. Also above those are some layers of granite and diorite and other types of igneous rocks. Um, as your lab will sort of indicate to you as you're reading through it, these layers that are now schist were probably pre-existing volcanic and sedimentary rocks that were metamorphosed when? Well, probably when these things above it that are slightly younger, intruded into them and metamorphosed them. Now, here's the deal. We want you to understand the attitude of these rocks, and in order to look at that, we need to look at how their pattern crops out across the bottom of the canyon. And what we see is that these colors of rocks generally cut straight across the bottom of the canyon. They don't care if there's a contour line there. They don't care if the river's there. They make straight lines right across the canyon. And that what indicates to us that those layers are vertical. And it's like you were looking straight up and down at a fin of rock that is sticking right up. But then, of course, the river cut down through that fin of rock, making sort of a V-shaped notch in there. And all of those layers, although they're not sedimentary layers necessarily, are being cut across, and they're vertical layers, and they're being cut across by the river. So, you guys should understand that the oldest Proterozoic, the early Proterozoic crystalline rocks, the igneous and metamorphic ones, do have an attitude, and that is that they tend to be in vertical layers. The next set of rocks that you guys should be familiar with are the middle Proterozoic sedimentary rocks. Now, in your lab, I do explain to you that they are sedimentary, they're very old, but they're still sedimentary. And there is one word that might confuse you a little bit, and that is the, with the Shinumo quartzite. The word quartzite in the old days used to refer to just a very hard sandstone. Nowadays, when we teach you in lab, we usually reserve that solely for the metamorphic rocks. But in the old days, we would distinguish between ortho and meta quartzite. And an ortho quartzite would be a sedimentary rock that was so hard and well indurated with quartz cement that it basically acts about the same and is just as hard as a metamorphic quartzite. So although that says quartzite, it is a sedimentary rock. Now these layers can be found also at the bottom of the canyon. They are above the older, early pro Proterozoic rocks, and they can be found right about in here, in here, right here, and over in this part of the map too. They sort of have a sort of a strike to them. Now, what you'll notice is if you were to look very closely at the contacts between those formations, that the contacts sort of in some places roughly are parallel to the contour lines, but in other places they cut right across. Now, also if you look down at the 
cross sections at the bottom of the page, you can see that those layers are the ones that are coming up this way. And in one direction, they sort of look flat, and in the other direction, they look like they're dipping. If you do look closely into the layers, you can actually find strikes and dips that have small dips to them, 6 degrees, 12 degrees. So those are dipping. And if, you, if I remind you of the cross sections and also that diagram down at the bottom of the map that's actually a photograph of the bottom of the canyon, right down here, it actually shows you that great unconformity between those Proterozoic, those younger Proterozoic rocks and the rocks above it. But anyways, we're focusing on these rocks down here for the time being, and what is their attitude? Again, by attitude I mean are they horizontal, dipping, or vertical? We determined that the oldest Proterozoic rocks are vertical. These middle Proterozoic rocks that are sedimentary rocks are largely dipping. So those ones are dipping. The third set of rocks are above those. And those are what we're going to refer to as the Paleozoic rocks. Remember, we've got the older Proterozoic, the middle Proterozoic, and then the Paleozoic rocks going from the Cambrian up to the Permian. And those rocks are, make up these patterns on the map that are roughly parallel to the contour lines in the canyons. And if you follow those darker lines and look very closely, you can see that they're roughly parallel to the contour lines. So that should make sense. A contour line is a line of equal elevation going across the map. And if the contact is roughly parallel to that, then you don't have to go up and down if you could stay along the contact. It might be kind of hard in the Grand Canyon because the slopes are so steep in some places, though. So the answer to a question that might be asking you, what's the attitude of the Paleozoic rocks in the Grand Canyon? Hopefully that helps you answer that question. They're more or less horizontal. So that should help you with those very first questions, finding the elevations, and then asking questions about the rocks, whether they're horizontal, dipping, or vertical. Now, as you work through the lab, I want you to just make sure that you read it very carefully, and the lab is organized like this. When you're reading the lab material, there's generally a bunch of questions that you need to answer that are numbered. One through oh, some higher number. I don't remember the highest number of the lab right now, but I could page through and find that. But you just need to answer those questions and write in the answers in that space. And there's another part of the lab that is in bold that has letters. Now those are very important because those lettered lines are actually little by little building the geological history of the Grand Canyon. So you should work your way through the lab, again very carefully, reading all the material, answer the questions that are numbered and any other questions that might be in there as well because I think there might be a few that maybe didn't quite get a number. But then also go through and read those bold parts so that you understand what the questions that you were just answering help you build as far as the history of the Grand Canyon. There are some blanks that are within those bold-faced areas as well. What I want you to do is fill in the blanks. And usually the answer that fills in the blank was answered just prior to that in some of the numbered questions. So that's your job is to go through this whole thing and answer all the questions fill in all the bold areas where there are blanks, and by the time you get to the end, you will be able to take all of the lettered sentences and string them together, kind of like a shish kebab, and little by little, read off the geological history of the Grand Canyon. So we're not leaving you without a net. This is how you can sort of slowly build it. And we're going to, later on, when you're doing your final project, you're going to be asked to do a similar thing with a different set of data. And you can refer back to this lab and see how we built the geological history of the Grand Canyon, and you can use that to build the geological history of the county that you'll be looking at for determining resources and building the geological history. Now, at the end of this lab, it asks you to actually write out the geological history of the Grand Canyon. Yes, we expect you to do that. 
No, we don't expect you to type it. We want you to actually, with a pen and pe or pencil, write it out. Of course, you should use a pencil. And it's going to be very, maybe, painful for your hand near the end because you have to actually write. So get started on that. Once you've finished answering all the questions and filling in the blanks, we want you to handwrite out the entire history of the Grand Canyon from A to double Z, or whatever that is, or is it just Z? I think there's a Z, and the Z is, in fact, it says, write out the geological history of the Grand Canyon. So make sure you go ahead and do that. Now, some things I also want to mention to you as we go through it. Um, you're going to be asked to write down the geological time periods and eons of the formations. And of course, those are listed on the map right here, so it shouldn't be hard to find those. In some cases, it's going to ask you to write down the symbols for the formations. Where do you find those? Well, they're either here or they're also on the map, so make sure you go ahead and do that. In some cases, you're going to be asked to write down the names of the formations. And in the younger stuff, or in the older stuff, I mean, not the younger stuff, the stuff way down here at the bottom, there are some actual names like the Rama Schist, Brahma Schist, the Vishnu Schist, and then some of them just say Young Granite and Pegmatite. Those are legal for your lab to be able to write down those words as the names. Um, and in some of the younger things, it just says pyroclastic deposit, intrusive uh, dikes, and so forth. So those are the things we want you to be writing down in there. Um, we want you to pay close attention to the types of unconformities. So there are three, count them, three types of unconformities. And you should know from class and lab that each one is associated with a sequence of events that tells us a history. So a nonconformity is an unconformity where you have crystalline igneous or metamorphic rocks underneath a surface, and above that surface are horizontal or layered sedimentary rocks. An angular unconformity is where you have sedimentary rocks that are dipping below and horizontal sedimentary rocks above. And then a disconformity is where you have horizontal sedimentary rocks above and below that unconformity surface. And the only way we might recognize that that's missing is by saying, oh, we're missing time. What? Time periods. We're missing rocks that might represent time periods. All right, so those are the three types of unconformities, and make sure that you can recognize them from this map and you understand what they mean. And again, the geological history that's in the bold is walking you through the sequence of events that makes each one of those unconformities. Uh, when you're answering the questions, please pay close attention that when you're asked about the oldest Paleozoic rocks, that you know that that is the Cambrian formations the Tepeat Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, and the Muav Limestone. Those are the oldest three layers that are Paleozoic. And then from then on, you will be progressively working your way through the younger ones. And as you're looking closely at those different sedimentary layers, they are made up of different types of rock. And your lab will be telling you whether they contain marine fossils, terrestrial fossils, whether there are sedimentary structures that indicate some sort of environment of deposition. So because you'll have an understanding of that and you have an understanding of the word transgression and regression, you should usually be able to determine if the sea level went up or if the sea level went down. So, for example, if you have a layer of sedimentary rock that was a terrestrial layer that might have, say, river sandstones and floodplain shales, and above that, you might have a beach sandstone and then some marine rock. What happened to sea level? And you guys can all answer that question very easily. There was a transgression. And alternatively, if you have some marine limestones or rocks with fossils in them that are shelly animals that live in the ocean, and then above that, you have maybe a sandstone beach or a sabka deposit or river sandstones and floodplain shales, that would be a regression. Now, there are some other instances here that happen as well. We're going to assume that when there was a big unconformity, that there was probably some erosion that went on, and that erosion generally happens during a regression. So, if you have marine rocks below an unconformity, and then you have marine rocks above an unconformity, that might be a place where we could actually say, well, we were depositing marine rocks, 
up to a certain point. There was a regression, and then during the low stand of sea level, we eroded off the surface of the earth, and many layers, maybe many thousands of meters of sediment might have gotten eroded away. We'll never know in this one spot. But then, if there are marine rocks directly above the unconformity surface, we might also say, well, there was a transgression above that. So several things indicate to us transgression versus regression. And that might be the rock type and, or the facies, the environment of deposition, or that might mean the fact that there's an unconformity there, that we know that there must have been exposure and perhaps erosion of what could have been thousands of feet of rock. So that represents long periods of time that could be not represented by sediments in, within the rock column. Keep in mind during this experience, you're going to have access to the map, but we've given you lots of hints and clues within the writing. If you get come to a point where you're not sure of what the answer is, keep in mind we've tried to make things as obvious as we can, and it might ask you to write the name of a formation, to write the name, uh, to write uh, a process like transgression or regression, decide which one it is. Keep in mind, sometimes we've just tried to make it so obvious, maybe it's sitting right there in front of you and when you want to ask, answer a question. But always keep in mind, if you really are stumped, ask us. Send us an email, call us. Do something that will put us into contact with you so we can help you understand. Don't get frustrated and certainly don't get mad. Now, at the end of it all, take those bold parts of the letter uh, discussion String them together. You can put some of them in your own words. That would be great, as long as you understand what it is you're saying. Otherwise, you can just copy them for verbatim. But write out the geological history of the Grand Canyon. Why? Because when you actually do write things down, it has a better chance that it's going to be committed to your memory a little bit better than doing things like just um, color coding things with highlighters or something like that. It's been shown that that definitely does not go into your brain. Plus, if you're typing things, they've interviewed stenographers in, uh, in court cases, and you can type and type and type stuff, but it doesn't go into your brain. They, they do not have a retention. But if you do actually physically write things out with your hand and a pencil, you actually have a better chance of having that material enter your brain and being committed to your memory a little bit better. So make sure you actually write that. That's why I always encourage you guys to write notes in class and stuff like that. Write it down, it'll help you. When you try to memorize things, it helps to write things over and over and over and over again. And that's super duper pretty really important. Okay, so write out that geological history. And then the last part of the lab we call backwards biostratigraphy. Now, this isn't exactly how it's done in, in the real world, but what we're going to try to imagine is that somebody collected a bunch of fossils and rock samples from the Grand Canyon, oh, the Grand Canyon, there it is, and certain formations. They recorded the layers, but then they mixed up the rock samples and they weren't sure which layer it came from. So what we're going to ask you guys to do is try to determine which set of samples goes with which layer. So that's why I'm calling it backwards biostratigraphy. Instead of just having the layer and trying to determine what the age is, we're going to try to realign those samples with the rock layer that they came from. Now, what we're going to supply with you is your good old friend, your identification key for the fossils. Now, we've made this into a Moodle scan so that you can download it. And then we've also given you some, a PowerPoint that has pictures of your fossils that we're going to be using for this exercise. Now, what you should be able to do is, here's the handout that we're going to ask you to fill in, is it has several columns. The first column is the sample number. So you're going to have to put A and B, A, B, A, B, C, A, B. I didn't put the A's and B's in there. But you're going to identify the fossil using your identification key and the pictures on the PowerPoint and write the genus name there. Don't forget to underline your genus name for A and then write the genus name for B. And then you're going to also put in the age range. You can just put down the time periods. You don't have to put upper or lower. Just put Devonian to Mississippian, for example, for the one fossil. And then put down 
The other fossil, which might be, for example, Mississippian to Triassic. Now, the next question is the age. What I want you guys to try to figure out then is, where do these two ranges of these different fossils overlap? And we should be able to narrow it down to one time period. So, if we had the range of Devonian to Mississippian for one of them, and Mississippian to Permian, or Mississippian to Triassic for the other one, you could actually graph that out on the geologic time scale and say, oh, those two ranges overlap in the Mississippian. So that's what you put in the age part of that handout. Now, that time corresponds to one of these. So you have to figure out which one of these formations is Mississippian. Where do you find that out? Well, on your geological map, of course, and write down the formation that they represent. So in the end, you'll have every space filled out on this with the formation name, the age, the range. And for each one, there should be just one age one time period that, that, that is that age. Uh, so if you run into something that you have more than one time period, then maybe there's a mistake someplace and you have to go back and figure out which one of the fossils you misidentified. Okay, again, if you have any questions about this or you're having trouble identifying some of your fossils, hopefully you've seen just about all of them before in your previous lab, so you should be familiar with them. Again, at any point during doing this lab, Please contact me or Frank if you get stuck and you can't quite figure something out. This will be due next Wednesday again at 5 o'clock. Again, we're making it 5 o'clock because I realized last week when I said noon, that's right at the end of my class, so that there were some people probably scrambling to finish the lab at the same time they were supposed to be zooming with me in my class when I gave you a whole bunch of brilliant information about the late Paleozoic. So, give us a call. Be safe, be well, and we will hopefully see you soon in the fall. And we're going to get through this time and make sure that we finish all of the, a few, uh, at least enough of the lab that we can give you credit for this class so that we don't have to go back and start over. I think that's the main thing to keep your eye on right now is that we're mainly going through these exercises so that you can earn the credit you deserve for doing these classes and we don't have to redo. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Give us a call if you have any questions.